Hey everyone, so Stephen here and we are the Mindset Junkies or I should say Mindset Junkie because it's just me coming at you today. And the reason for that, so Ali is away at Unleash the Power Within led by Tony Robbins and we decided that this would be a little bit of a special episode. So it was going to be focused on stress, the way to handle stress, better relate to stress and so on. And now that's firmly in my kit bag. So I teach people mindfulness, meditation and other ways of how they can use mindset to overcome some of the perceptions that they have about some of the stress uh, that people face. So this is why it's a bit of a special session because we're going to use, firstly you can see there's some slides up here, we don't normally do slides, uh, but I felt as though I wanted to come in and do slides more so so you didn't have my mug on the screen for the next uh, 45 minutes, hour or so, or however long this takes. So let's get rolling with this one. So I am conscious that, at least in my world, <laughs> we do tend to bounce from scenario to scenario, meeting to meeting, experience to experience, and we very often rarely take a time to just pause. So we're going to do just that before the start of this session. So if you just find yourself comfortable in your seats, just have your back upright, your shoulders relaxed, if that is comfortable for you. You may either choose to close your eyes or just lower your gaze slightly, and we're just going to do a minute or so of mindful breathing. So let's start by just taking a deep breath in through the nose and breathe it right down into the belly. And then release. Once again, take a deep breath in through the nose and then release. Now let's take another deep breath in through the nose. And as you breathe in, just notice the sensation of your chest expanding and then releasing as you let go of that breath. So now let's just ease into our normal breathing cycle. Just breathing in and out. And as you breathe in, just notice the feelings or sensations of the breath as it enters your nose or mouth. Maybe a warmness, maybe cold. Just feel the sensations in the body as you breathe, the chest expanding maybe, maybe a sensation in the throat. Just notice what it feels like to breathe. To just be present. So now we're just going to focus on just one last full cycle of the breath. So what I'd like you to do is just tune into the breath as it starts, right down into the belly, and then to every last second before you start your next in-breath. So let's start. Just take a deep breath, breathing in through the nose, holding and then releasing right to the very last out breath. Okay, if you just open your eyes and just bring yourself back into the room. You may stretch, just whatever you need to do just to, to feel comfortable. Now just ask yourself how you feel at this moment in time after that short practice. So this was just a couple of minutes. 
And it's like, just as I mentioned, we, we often do have a lot of distractions going on within our lives. And doing a pause just like this can help to ground ourselves. And the thing is, it's a lot of these distractions that are actually the causes of a lot of the bad stress that we experience, which we'll go into throughout this topic. So what I'm going to do to begin with is talk about what stress is, right? So I can see a number of pictures up on the screen here, right? And what I'm trying to emphasize with this is that there, there is actually no real clear definition of stress that basically applies to every single one of us. We all have our own personalities, we all have our own emotions, we have our own experiences, thoughts. You know, we all respond to things that essentially cause us stress in different ways. A prime example that comes to mind, and this will definitely separate people who are listening into this, is deadlines. So you've got a deliverable for work, for university, a project, whatever it may be, right? That deadline is in, say, two weeks' time. So some people absolutely love the fact that that deadline is in two weeks' time because it means you've got two weeks to do stuff. You've got plenty of time. Other people don't like that. Other people like it when it gets a few days before the end. So three days before the deadline, say, for when they're under pressure to deliver it. You know, they, they work best by having this pressure of the deadline because it basically gives them the motivation to actually go ahead and do it. Other than that, it's kind of optional, isn't it? The thing is, as I mentioned, there's other people, though, who like doing things way ahead because it actually gives them the comfort that things are done out the way. And it means that if they need to, they can go ahead and revisit things. And the thing is, because of that, these two people are experiencing stress in different ways. So the person who likes to leave things to the last minute, you know, that pressure is is good for them because it's how they operate. You know, it may also be chaotic for them because they might not do it in the right ways. But ultimately, that is the thing that makes them get things done. Now, the other person, they're basically looking at it from a, a perspective of, right, if that was me, if I was leaving things to the last minute, then all hell will be breaking loose. You know, it's, it's not right. Why have you given me this thing with such a short deadline? You know, I'm stressed because I need to prepare. Whereas, as I say, the other person, they may be thinking of it differently in their own perspective. So the first thrives, well, the person who has the short deadline, they thrive on last minute action. Whereas the second looks to avoid last minute action and they thrive on knowing things are done safely and in a complete way. And, you know, this, this applies in many, many other walks of life too. It's not just about the deadlines. So just have a think about yourself of, of like, in your own experiences, like, how is it that you're actually managing stress in these respects? Like, how does stress occur in some of your lives? We can see a number of things in the images here, like, we've, we've got the nurse there. Evidently, that stress that they're experiencing with their patients, it's pretty full on, it's pretty full on, it's demanding. We've got the people who are in the relationship down in the bottom. And, you know, that could be a conversation that has caused that stress. It might, that might not be work-related or anything. You know, we can make a lot of assumptions about what is going on within these pictures. And, you know, each one of us could build our own little story about what these people are actually experiencing and how they're potentially responding effectively or ineffectively to some of the stresses that they are actually experiencing. So, like I say, the key message in this one is that we all do respond to stress differently. So just because somebody is acting a certain way to stress doesn't mean that that is the right way. The right way is basically something that you can find yourself, which one of the purposes of this session is to arm you with a few set, a few tools uh, that can actually help you out with this. So the thing is, though, with, with stress, there are a number of common themes around stress, which basically these arise through a concept, it's a military-based concept, uh, which is what we call a VUCA world. So it it's basically four traits that we experience. So there's volatility, there's uncertainty, there's complexity, and there's ambiguousness. And these are in play all around us. And 
in some form they all cause an element of stress regardless of what regardless of how we actually go and respond to this thing now the key thing is about how we do actually go ahead and and respond to it right so let's take an example so i'm going to call upon the finance markets here so many of us we have some form of financial investments you know it it, it for those of who, you who will be saying, well, no, I don't. I don't have any stocks and shares or anything like that. Chances are you have a pension or a 401k. And in line with that, you essentially have some kind of financial investments, right? And what we see on the screen here is a snapshot of the last five years of a popular fund. of It's called the S&P 500. And this is often a good benchmark of investment growth because it basically involves some of the biggest companies in the world. So typically, I don't think you'd be that far wrong. If the S&P grows, then chances are so does your pension or your 401k if you're in America. Chances are if it declines, then so probably does your investments in your pension and S&P in your 401k. Now, there's two points that I want to point to on this graph. So the first is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's basically March 2020. What happened on March 2020? So that was the pandemic. Bang. You can see massive decline. Three and a half thousand down to about 2,300-ish, something like that. Now, the stock markets fell through the floor at this point simply because you know, well, at the time we weren't prepared for it. We, we, it was uncertain. It was the volatility coming into play. Volatility, uncertain. It was ambiguous. We didn't know what was happening because of the pandemic. And what causes a drop like this is when we get investors and institutes getting nervy. So they're basically getting a little bit stressed. They're like, I don't know what's going to happen. So we sell. The VUCA world basically kicks in. Most notably, the probably the uncertainty part of it here. And the thing is, what often happens is that it's actually too late by the time some of us actually decide to take some appropriate action. So it would have actually been pretty fantastic, wouldn't it, if right at the top of the peak, we would have made the decision to sell. But that's actually rarely the case because it is hard to understand. It's hard to know when exactly the peak is in things like this. Now, if you look at it, though, in a bit long term, what happened next? So there was this massive drop for around 30 days, something like that. Pretty much wiped about 40% off of the S&P 500. But then what happened after is it went on a rally and actually had the best rally that it's had. I think it was actually ever with this. It doubled from the 2,300 to over 4,600, and this was in the next year and a half. So, what happened when the market started declining? Some investors got a bit nervy, got a little bit stressed. You know, my investments, my investments are dropping, you know, this is unreal, I'm gonna sell. So they respond, they react to it, they sell. But then what actually happens is, things start ramping up again. Now, what I'm not saying is that this is guaranteed to happen every single time. In fact, at this very time of recording, we are basically going through something similar to this that is on the screen at this point in time. And there is no telling when it is going to be improved. But what I'm saying is that we have different ways of how we can respond to it because it is basically stress. So if we link it to stress, right? So as I say, the investors panic in March 2020. Basically, their future was at risk. Their pension was getting blasted. They felt like they would basically lose a fortune. So, as I say, to resolve the stress, they basically got out. Then, as I mentioned, a month or even days later, it boomed again. But still uncertain, they probably held off a little bit. And what may have actually happened is when it got to maybe mid-2021 or end of 2021, that's when they were like, well, actually, yeah, things are starting to look really up again. I'm going to invest. And the thing is, that's a bit too late because that's when they've sold when it's down and they've bought when it's up. So what they've done is actually lost out on a hell of a lot of money and cemented it into their portfolio. 
Now, you just have to ask yourself, what would have happened if they'd have basically not reacted to what it was that they was experiencing? Had faith in what it was that they, the reason why they'd chosen the S&P 500 as their investment in the first place and recognise that, yeah, long term, this is a growth item. Rather than letting the stress control them and letting, I'll come into it later, but letting the amygdala kick in, which is a bit more of the fight or flight response and said that I want to get out. I want to save as much money as possible. When in fact, what it's done is actually cost them a hell of a lot more. Now, I know I've kind of laboured labored this point and it kind of takes us onto a topic that, you know, this is focusing on the bad stress side of things. This is the things that are potentially keeping us up at night. This is like, am I going to have enough money to retire? You know, have I lost 40% of my investment pretty much overnight? You know, it's those kind of things that they are somewhat out of our control, as I'll come on to later, but things that we can choose to respond in different ways. So let's explore good versus bad stress. Because, so ultimately, it's important to recognize that if we didn't have stress in our life, then we we wouldn't progress, we wouldn't develop. Now, I actually saw this on social media, it was a, a few weeks ago, so I did some Googling and pulled it back off of Google Images. It's by wholehearted school counselling uh, for reference, pa- uh, reference purposes. And this emphasises a number of different traits. It, it just emphasises the fact that, as I say, not all stress is bad. You know, we wouldn't be developing. We wouldn't experience new things. We wouldn't progress in our lives. We basically need the challenge that stress brings to help us to move forward. But we need to only do it in the right ways. Now, creating stress around things that inspire us, that move us forward, that improve our performance, and that is basically so incredibly healthy for us, in fact. But the key thing is, is that, that the stress needs to remain short term. If you remember back to some of the earlier episodes that Ali, Ali and I spoke about, we talked about goals. We talked about how you should have this big, hairy, ambitious goal, but that big high ambitious goal if we focus too relentlessly on it as that big massive chunk then that itself can actually cause unhealthy stress the key is about breaking that down into the smaller chunks this is where we're talking about here about turning the goals that can motivate us into short-term goals short-term goals that build up and lead into a long-term goal that is where we can create healthy stress if, if we set ourselves a target, we often use th- things like fitness and health because it's where Ali and I have, have had both a lot of transformation in our life. Let's take running a marathon. If you say to yourself that I want to run a marathon in 12 months' time, if you don't break that down and you set off on day one trying to run 26.3 miles, you will injure yourself. You will get hurt. There's no question about that. But if you break that down and say, right, 26.3 miles in 12 months' time, by the end of month one, I want to be able to run five kilometres. The end of month two, ten. The end of month six, I want to run 20. You know, what you're doing is you're setting yourself those small targets that you can build up. And as a result, it's not stressful because you've got your big target, which is great. You've got your big thing that you're aiming for, but you're breaking it down into them very small chunks. So what it means is you're not becoming as stressed about it. When you finish your run, you're not as demotivated because you're like, oh, God, you know, I'm, I've am i only just started and I, I can't run 26 miles. That's where the stress becomes bad. And, you know, the key with stressful situations as well is about how we perceive them and ultimately how we respond to them. We can basically view events in in our life that are entirely out of our control and we basically get stressed about them. Take out the example about the stock market before. That is entirely out of our control. The only thing that is in our control is our ability to withdraw our funds and potentially lose it, potentially gain from it as well, I should add. You know, we may become emotionally attached to whatever the experiences are. 
whatever the situations are. Or it may even be that we're doing this even though we can actually do very little to actually influence them. I think, so at the time of recording, so we're, we're currently in mid-March, and, you know, an incredibly sad example today is, is naturally the war in Ukraine. This it is absolutely heartbreaking. You know, I think it's one of the first times ever that I've been tuning in to just an, a selective news page for live updates every day. It's heartbreaking to hear what is going on over there. I know it is. But the thing is, we also have to think that influencing that is actually directly out of our control. So if you're becoming stressed about this, about what the potential outcomes are, like I've even seen media reports of like, is this going to turn into a nuclear war? That's entirely out of our control. Even if the answer is yes, there's nothing much that we as individuals can do. What we can do, though, is the small things that can make a difference to other people. So it's things like, there's been a lot of drives around, hasn't there? Like the need for clothes, the need for items, um, buying things from people who are based in Ukraine on Etsy and dropping a message saying, look, don't deliver the item, it's fine, just take the money, it's fine. Offering support of our knowledge. You know, this is a prime example, me running this session, hopefully helping you with some of this stuff as well. But, you know, we have to remember that if it's something that is firmly out of our control, then we have to figure out a way that we aren't going to let this, this bog us down just as the stuff on that left-hand side. Because if we don't do that, we are basically on a slippery slope to depression and anxiety. And I don't say that to intend to cause more stress. It's just what I'm going to do is arm you with some of the tools today to actually help you uh, to manage this better. Now, to bring this to life a little bit more, this is a quote that I use in pretty much all my material relating to stress and mindfulness and so on. And, and it's, it's a quote by Stephen Covey, which was inspired by Viktor Frankl. So just to shed a little bit of light on Victor for those who don't know of his work, he, he is a Holocaust survivor. And in the foundations of his work, he often reflects upon his experiences in the concentration camps. Now, what this can ultimately be done is it can be translated into an outlook on stress, focusing on things like present moment and stuff like that, which also translates into kind of resolving stress. But if we look at it from this angle of stress, right, so just think about it. He, as many other millions of people, they were exposed to inhumane conditions. And ultimately, for the vast majority, it was actually death. The end. The end of, uh, end of it. Now, that's something that, if you're in that position that would cause an unreal amount of stress, right? Because what you're doing, you're going from day to day uncertain as to whether you are actually going to be alive tomorrow. Are you going to be one of the people that basically gets taken out and gets shot? Now, what Victor, Victor reflects on is that, you know, that was definitely a possibility for him as it was in many others. But what he saw differently was that he had an outlook. He had a way to look at the experiences that he was going through, which were horrendous. But what his outlook was, was that when he would get out of there, he would share his story and he would do so. So this never, ever happens again. And that's what kept him alive. So he took all the stresses, all the experiences of focusing day to day, not knowing if he was going to be alive the very next day, and hung it upon this mission, this vision that he was going to make it out of there, and that he was going to tell his story, and that he was going to stop this from ever happening again. Now, that was the way that he treated and responded to his experiences. And this specific quote to kind of reflect on that it talks about the stresses that we experience 
Now, these are absolutely nothing compared to what Victor experienced there, right? But it's with every stress, we have a choice. We can either react to it right away, or we can pause. We can reflect. And then we can respond to it. You know, instead of just acting on impulse, as soon as something triggers us and responding to it, we actually have a choice in how we actually do go ahead and act. But the thing is, our habits, our assumptions, tell us that a certain action is needed. Our amygdala, our flight or flight, fight or flight response, takes over our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for rational thinking, things that will tell us to do the right thing, and tells us to do something rash causes stress so I'm a science geek I love my neuroscience so I'm gonna go a little bit geeky on you here with this stuff right so what, what this will emphasize is a bit of the neuroscience behind stress and it will also look at it with a lens of mindfulness as well because we will be coming at this from a mindfulness angle so first off stress, focus, performance, happiness, they are some of the real, I'll call them pillars, as to what mindfulness research has been based around. Because it's been proven, not just through subjective um, survey-based studies, but also through technology-based studies, like using MRI machines, that mindfulness does benefit people in those ways. It does help to reduce stress, helps to improve focus, helps to boost happiness, helps to benefit sleep and so on. There's loads, loads of different research topics around this. And you can see that just on this graph here, that since around the late 80s, when Daniel Goleman term, he basically coined, it was about emotional intelligence. It was where he basically founded these steps around emotional intelligence. It was a framework around it. And mindfulness was one of the baseline elements of how you can begin to boost your emotional intelligence, because it's all about looking inwards. It's about being present and kind of reflecting on yourself. So research has absolutely boomed and it continues to boom simply because of the benefits that mindfulness has been proven to bring into our lives. Now, there's a couple of topics relating to stress that I'm actually going to focus on here. And one, it's based on a paper that I wrote, which was reviewing literature around a concept called neurodegeneration. Now, to simplify this, our brains consist of billions of neurons which what these do is they connect together and they share information. It's a very simplified way to describe it. But it's basically an amazing action that basically keeps us alive. It allows us to do the things that we do, like me talking here today is because neurons are connecting in my brain, continuously sharing information and so on. Now, over time, these neurons degrade. They basically die. Now, the research that I was doing was in the role that stress plays on neurodegeneration. And what I actually found was that unmanaged stress accelerates neurodegeneration. But the thing is, that isn't all. What recent research has found is that new neur neurons are actually born in adult brains. So previously, it was assumed that we had our billions of neurons when we were born and all that happened was that they died they never renewed there was never new neurons that were born but what this research actually found was that that's not the case so new neurons are born in adult brains but the thing is unmanaged stress hinders the development of new neurons too so it's not only that it accelerates the ability for neurodegeneration so basically neurons dying, it also inhibits the birth of new ones. Now what this means in our everyday life is that by not effectively managing our stressors, the things that trigger us, the way that we respond to some of the experiences that we face in our life, we are actually increasing our risk of degenerative brain diseases as well as naturally less extreme such as memory loss. We're essentially causing ourselves harm you know, you, you, you will ultimately be feeling it on the outside. If you're living a stressful life, then yeah, you'll 100% be feeling it. But it's also things that are happening in here as well. Now, this, this next one 
it's a favourite study of mine. It was done in uh, 2013 uh, by a research group led by Antoine Lutz. And what this was using an MRI machine, so this isn't using any kind of survey-based response, responses. And as with most mindfulness-based studies, they took novice meditators as well as people who had no experience meditating as well. And the idea is that I typically compare and contrast between the two. Now, what this was doing is whilst the test subjects was actually in the MRI machine, the experiment leader would take a thermode, which is basically a piece of metal attached to a wire that will deliver a sharp heat pain. It gets really, really hot. And what they did is put it against the wrist of people who was in the MRI machine. And what they was looking for was a couple of things. They was looking at the responses within the brain whilst the heat thermode was actually being applied. Basically, the activity within the brain, how long it was going on for and things like that. What they was also looking for is when the test subject had an idea that this was coming, what was their brain doing to prepare for it? Now, what they actually found was that novice meditators and experienced meditators, they did respond differently to this. There was this anticipatory stress, as you can expect, but people who did not meditate, their brain was active way before the thermode was actually applied, much earlier than what those experienced meditators had in their brains. As well, the after effects also were different. So the kind of lingering pain, let's call it, it actually went on longer for people who didn't meditate than it did for people who did. Now that's interesting because what's that say, what that says is that <clears throat> When we don't practice meditate, so non-practitioners, they're basically experiencing anticipatory stress. And when a stressful event happens, it's actually longer for them to get over it as well. Now that's it in terms of the, the neuroscience side of things here. But what I'm going to do is talk a bit more on a practical sense. So this is results based on a program that I run. And what we do with this is we release a survey before the program. We then do the program. Typically, it's a two full day intervention. We will do a 28 day challenge where we then do an email campaign, which is looking at insights, it's looking at practice, it's looking at reflections. It's basically helping people to embody a practice of mindfulness. We then do another survey. So what we've done is we've done a survey before to get their before state. We've done the intervention. We've helped them to instill habits around the intervention. And then we've done another survey. And these are basically the results. So just to pick a couple out based on the topic of stress, I am able to pause before reacting. There's an uplift there of 20%. So 20% of people said that they was, well, more than that, was actually better at responding to stress. They was able to pause before reacting. If we're thinking about the attention topic, 21% difference between people saying that they was able to essentially notice when their attention had been dragged away. When in conflict with somebody, I take time to fully understand what is driving their perspective. Now, this is very important because often that is the basis of a lot of arguments. If we don't really understand what somebody is saying and we come out and talk about what a solution is to that, then that could cause stress for both them and us. As we can see there, 19% of people saying that they were better at that kind of skill. Now, this program was purely based on mindfulness. It was mindfulness, active listening. It was all things about being present. So this takes us on to the steps to resolve. Now, a lot of what we've covered so far, it translates into us essentially running our lives on autopilot. A lot of the stresses that we face, like look at that example that I mentioned right at the end there. 
understanding that other person's perspective. All that takes us to pay attention to what that person is saying. Now, I'd just like you to reflect on this for a moment. Just think back to an, an argument that you may have had or heated discussion that you may have had with a loved one recently. Let's just think of a mild one at the moment. To what degree was this argument on the basis of either one of you not listening properly? Right. I would say that this is probably most of the time, right? And it's most of the time when we're trying to do two things at once. You know, I have to put my hand up, right? Saturday at three o'clock when I'm watching football, if my wife comes in and asks me a question, then... You know, I'll be I'll be watching football. I will do my best to listen to her. But chances are I will ask a similar question relating to that later on, later on in the day. You know, because we think that we're good at multitasking, but we're actually not. And it's where we should focus our attention on one thing at once. And when we're on autopilot, this is when we're out daydreaming, thinking about other things, which I actually go into the next slide, which describes this very, very well, right? So the first one is that we do tend to ruminate about things that are either in the past or that are in the future. So if we look at the example of looking out into the past, what we're likely doing here from a stress perspective is beating ourselves up for something that we said, did, or maybe didn't say or didn't do. You know, this is causing us stress because you're like, oh, damn it, you know, I really wish I did that. I really wish I did that. But the thing is you can't change it. The past is the past. Now, if you think about the same thing with the future, this could also be thinking about scenarios that might not even happen. I'm sure that you've been there before, where you've been worrying about, say, a presentation at work, thinking, what if this question comes up? What if that question comes up? What if my technology breaks? What if my power goes out? You know, all those things. But what if it doesn't? You know, you've wasted all that time and energy on thinking of all these scenarios, fictitious scenarios, that aren't even coming true. Now, the next one about being less aware, right? This is the example with the football. <laughs> we may mishear things. We may misunderstand things. The result of this is that it could essentially cause arguments. You know, it's the same for this next one about being distracted. We're trying to do too many things at once. We're causing stress in our own lives and potentially in others because we're not paying the right attention to what is actually going on. Now, what I'd say is actually the biggie here is about how we may act on habit and assumptions. You know, we have a tendency to go and revert back to do all the things that we know are safe. You know, even things about worry about the minor details, which again causes stress. You know, depending on what type of person you are, this this goes back to the, the statement at the very start about, you know, the deadlines, right? When it comes to booking a flight, just reflect. Would you just go and just go, right, that flight, I'm having it, I'm going to get it, pay for it, that's it, done. Or are you one of those people who's looking into every single minor detail about that specific flight, making sure that it all lines up, that you've got your transport from the airport to the hotel in place, uh, that you've made sure that you've uh, got the hotel and that you probably contacted them to make sure that the room's all ready and you know, all that kind of thing, right? So that is causing extra work. And, you know, it, it may provide you a degree of comfort, which is fine. You know, so long as that stress is a short-term stress, that is perfectly fine. Whatever makes you happy, whatever keeps you comfortable. But it's just to be mindful that if it's actually translating the long-term worry... If for months before you go on holiday, you're worrying about every intricate detail, then you need to do something to basically come off of this kind of thinking, come away from this kind of thinking. So I'd mentioned before about mindfulness and this basically being a way that we can help to overcome stress. And it's simply because mindfulness by its very nature is about becoming aware. It's about switching into our present moment, the experiences that we are having today not what about might happen tomorrow the day after the next week not about looking back and worrying about what that person said or how that person may have perceived you it's about what is happening in this exact moment in time 
Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through a mindfulness exercise to basically give you a little bit of insight into this. Now this will just be a short practice. It's basically a practice around how we focus our attention and this will be for around eight minutes. Let's begin by taking a moment to allow your body to settle. Find a comfortable position that allows your spine to be long, but with a natural curve in the lower back. You can either close your eyes or keep them open with a soft gaze downward just a few feet in front of you. As you take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth, just let the belly and shoulders relax. Today I'll guide you through a focused attention practice where we focus attention on the breath. This will help us to calm our mind and also to relax the body. So before we start the practice, let's take a full deep breath in, breathing in through the nose and a long breath out through the mouth. Now just allow the breath to find its natural rhythm, breathing in and out. So let's begin this practice by connecting with what draws you here. It may be a wish for greater well-being for yourself and for others. It may be a desire for some rest and calm. It may be something else. Just bring that to mind. Now bring your awareness to the breath. As you breathe, you may notice movement of the abdomen or the chest. You may notice sensations of air passing at the tip of the nose. Could be the sensation of air passing through the throat. Or maybe it's a sense of the whole body breathing. Wherever the sensation is most vivid for you, just allow your attention to rest there. Breathing in and breathing out. So in focusing on the breath, can you notice the moment when the inhale begins, how it continues, and then the moment it ends. Can you notice the very moment when the exhale begins? Just notice, is there a slight pause between the exhale and the next inhale? Is there a pause between 
the exhale and the inhale. Try to keep your attention focused through one complete cycle of breath. Let's see if you can sustain your focused attention on the breath for another additional breath. And then another complete cycle of breath. Allow the breath to be a kind of home base, an anchor for our awareness. Just focusing our attention on the breathing out and the breathing in. Thoughts will come and thoughts will go. There's no need to push them away or to chase after them. When the mind wanders, just come back to the breath. Come back to the moment, right here, right now. Breathing. And now let's finish this focused attention practice by taking a full deep breath in, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As we just draw our attention back to the room and open our eyes. So welcome back from the practice. I hope like the practice earlier that it helped to kind of refresh things and at least press reset for you. You know, for me, it just shows the power that even just taking a few deep breaths can have on our life. Now, as we move on, I just want to reflect. Just ask yourself, how did you find it, that exercise? You may want to pause the video just take some notes in your journal or just sit and pause and just think, how did you find it? How did it help? How did it not help? But to move on, so as I noted, so mindfulness is just one of many ways that we can begin to combat stress in our lives. And to close the thread on mindfulness, there are two ways that we can begin to practice. So one is an integrated practice. And this is where we can basically do it with other things. So we can see the girl there walking her dog. This means that at that time, so she could be doing mindful walking. She could be doing some breath work. She could be doing an open awareness practice where she's tuning into the beauty of everything that is around her. She could be listening to a guided meditation on some headphones. 
you know, these the idea is is that this is where we're doing something, but we're doing mindfulness with that thing as well. Now, the other thing is that on the right hand side, which is more like going to the gym. So this is where we would dedicate the time to our practice. So just like the practice that we've been through now, this is where we're saying for the next 15 minutes, I am going to practice meditation. And we've got a lot of resources that can help you with that. So there's a couple of meditations on the Mindset Junkies YouTube channel. If you check out the Tranquil Adventures YouTube channel, there is a lot more meditations on there. There's apps like Headspace, Waking Up, Insight Timer, all that offer guided meditations to you to help. So in terms of different things that we can do, mindfulness is just one way, as we say. It's a way that personally I find very effective, but it is not my only way. There's actually a lot of things on the screen here that also help me too. It's finding what works for you. That is the key thing. So going for a walk, spending some time with the family, reading, baking, spending some time with friends, exercising. So exercising is probably one of the most effective things that you can do to combat stress, the bad stress, cycling, whatever sport you like, squash, badminton, going to the gym. You know, the key is you need to discover this yourself because I can go out and say to you that, so for me, mindfulness, running and cycling are the three things that I do myself alone that help me with stress. Spending time with the family is also another one that I enjoy. I enjoy eating nice food, going out for dinner with friends and family. You know, those things are the things that help me. But it's about finding what ignites you, what helps you to overcome some of your stresses. Now, we've actually reached the end of this session. So once again, I just wanted to thank you for tuning in. But I just wanted to leave you with something. It's actually two things. They're very related. So I mentioned about the integrated practice for mindfulness. So there's one thing that you can do whenever you experience your stress, whenever you experience your trigger. It's called stop. Okay. So the first part of stop is to simply stop. Stop what you're doing. If it's a phone call, try and get out of the phone call. If it's a text message, put your phone away. If it's an email, put it away. The next step is the T, which is to take a deep breath. Breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. And do that as many times as you need to just regulate yourself. Now observe, observe what is going on within the body and within the mind. Just notice any feelings, any thoughts, any emotions. And then proceed, then move forward. Because in this, what you've done is created space between the stimulus and the response. And just as that quote says, there is a lot of power in our freedom in doing that. So just remember, pause. And once again, thank you for tuning in to Mindset Junkies. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us. It really, really helps us out. It means that we can begin to bring this awesome content to you. Share the channel with your friends, with your family, with others who you think may benefit from this. You know, Ali and I love coming on and recording these and you know, the more exposure that we get on them, the more we can basically bring to all of you. So thanks again and all the best.